Zane could feel the poems taking form, shaping things. As he experimented, he imagined he could almost feel the power surging through the keys of the typewriter. It exhilarated him, but there was fear too. If not for his young assistant, Emil, he would have given it up, but Emil convinced him otherwise. He too had a way with words. Hartman kept talking, giving Barry the grand tour, clearly proud of the place. He went on and on about his hunting trophies, and Barry was impressed, but he was here on business. He raised his voice, cut through the monologue. Hey, Hartman, where's Al? Hartman stopped in mid-sentence, annoyed at the interruption. He nodded at the hulking orderly standing nearby. The man smiled and clapped a practice hand on Barry's shoulder. Hartman followed the fall of Alan Wake with his binoculars. When the rider hit the water, he ordered Jack to take the boat to him. The spot was easy to see in the dark, even with all the extra lights in the boat. The flare floated and kept burning even in the water. Jack turned the radio louder as the engine sputtered. The music was rough and clanking, something the Anderson brothers would no doubt have enjoyed. But Hartman chose to ignore it. Wake was finally within his reach. Hartman knew he was no creator. He had no ambitions on that front. And he certainly didn't want to end up like every artist he had worked with here, damaged in ways that were hard to describe, or worse. It was enough for Hartman to maintain creative control and provide direction, to be a producer. That was what most of these people were in need of anyway. Of course, suitable subjects were few and far in between. I stared at the Viking paraphernalia that littered the area, surrounding an unlikely centerpiece. A full-side stage complete with an impressive sound system with all the trimmings, including a dragon. It took a special kind of crazy to build something like this in a remote field. When the sky split open with a deafening boom and the music started blasting, it felt strangely appropriate. For the moment, Barry was just glad he had survived the fall. He had been separated from Al, and there was no easy way to climb back up. He told himself he'd be okay, okay in the gloomy forest at night. He would just have to wait for a while for Al to find his way down. Barry turned when he heard the heavy footsteps and saw the movement. The man-shaped shadow lunged at him from the bushes, an axe held high. Barry screamed and threw up his hand. The world exploded. Mott knew that Wake was smarter than him. Wake had more money, a beautiful wife, everything. And Hartman said Wake was important. That made him better than Mott. But Mott was calling the shots now. He'd expected Wake to whimper and grovel, but instead, he seemed willing to fight. Mott knew he'd gotten under Wake's skin, if only Mott actually had his wife. The thought made him shiver. Hartman wasn't happy. Mott could see it in his eyes. He quickly lowered his own. He had made a mess of it, and he knew it. The shame of failure was hard to bear. He hadn't expected Wake to say he needed more time, and he blurted out two days less than Wake had asked for to show him who was in charge. But that wasn't part of Hartman's plan. Hartman hurried down the corridor. He had disliked leaving Wake when he was surely at his most susceptible to therapy. But this was not an ordinary storm. Wake had been writing, and he had woken something up in the depths of the lake. Now, it was coming for him. Hartman had naturally prepared for a situation like this. The idiot brothers would keep Wake distracted while Hartman double-checked everything, just to be sure. Hartman watched as Wake's features slackened. The man was bullheaded, no doubt. Even lying on the bed, he'd almost broken Hartman's nose the second time. But with a little time, he could break Wake down, give him proper direction. Wake was easily the most promising subject he'd had. Well, since Tom, really. Sleep well, Alan, Hartman whispered with a smile. Let me take care of you. He sniffed hard to clear his throbbing nose, swallowed blood, and barely tasted it. Agent Nightingale stared at the passed out rider. The man was sleeping off one hell of a night. Nightingale felt a stab of envy at Wake's oblivion, but he had a job to do. He put the gun to Wake's head and almost became a murderer. His hand shook and his throat felt tight and dry. Biting his teeth, he tried again to pull the trigger. He lost the nerve. Wake stirred. Nightingale would have to settle for an arrest. The storm raged on as the Anderson brothers walked unsteadily away from the clinic with the other patients in tow, knowing that this time they wouldn't return. The darkness around them seethed with horrors, but Tor and Odin were unafraid. Their eyes glinted with guile, 
They knew every secret path, and there was blood on their hands. They had fought these shades before. The dark presence followed the choreography laid out to it in the manuscript, growing stronger and stronger, moving like a storm from one scene of destruction to the next. But it was still bound to follow the story and chain to the dark place it came from. When the story reached the end it longed for, it would finally be free. It's 1976. Madness reigns at the Anderson farm. Contrary to all logic, the head east ingredient of their moonshine is unfiltered water from Cauldron Lake. The Andersons feel like gods. Odin can't stop laughing. He contemplates cutting his eye out. Tor runs across the field, naked, shrieking, hammer in his hand, trying to catch lightning. Their songs have power. Something ancient is stirring in the depths, coming back. Again, Alice's screams rang in the stillness of the night. I saw myself run toward the cabin, flashlight in my hand. I followed my past self. I was an out-of-body observer, a time traveler in a crazy drunken dream. This was the beginning. The night Alice had disappeared. The mystery of what had happened during the missing week was about to reveal itself. When he stopped the car at the Anderson farm, Walter felt relieved. Oblivion was close at hand. The brothers wouldn't miss a jar of moonshine or two in the booby hatch. But then he saw the man on the porch, and he knew who it was. Driving for his life and knowing it was useless, he didn't realize he was crying until he couldn't see the road for the tears. Hartman had never felt as anxious as during the week after Maud had managed to lose the wakes. Their car stood by the path that had once led to Diver's Isle. Hartman thought about Thomas Ain's cabin in the depths. It was only a matter of time before Wake started writing. They had to be found, and fast. The moment he heard on the police radio that Sheriff Breaker had picked up Wake, he was already in his car driving toward town. For a moment, Hartman considered strangling the idiot. Mott was mean-spirited, but easily manipulated, an emotional infant who lived for his approval. Wake, by contrast, was a far more difficult subject. Mott had given him too much leash. In two days, who knew what could happen? Hartman would have to find a way to rein him in, and quickly. Deputy Mulligan tuned Thornton's chatter out. He didn't think writers were particularly useful people, and a huge manhunt for one stuck him as idiotic, certainly not worth the missed opportunity for coffee and pie. It wasn't even clear what the man had done, except run from them at the trailer park. Mulligan knew he wasn't alone. The sheriff's patience with the Fed was running out. As the deputies hauled Wake and Wheeler away, Agent Nightingale eagerly examined the stack of papers Wake had been carrying. It was incomplete, a collection of random pages, but there was enough. He saw his own name in there, among others. His hand shook with emotion. Finally, it was proof. He had been right all along. 